One of the biggest problems the so-called experts always have with the Electric Universe model of cosmology is we don't buy into the idea of a cosmic speed limit. In fact, our model requires faster than light travel. There's plenty of evidence to prove this, but the funniest part is the standard model requires it too. They just don't know it. Allow me to explain. If you didn't have instantaneous communication, closely orbiting stars would experience crazy torque so much that in a matter of hundreds of years they'd get flung apart. Now, obviously this isn't happening, and that's because gravity doesn't travel like a wave, at least not like the way we're told. Now, how do we know? Well, there's a few ways. For one, because the Earth orbits where the Sun is now, not where it was 8.5 minutes ago when its location information, supposedly, left the Sun as a gravity wave. Now, that wouldn't be a big deal if the Sun were holding still, but it's not. It's rocketing around the galactic center at a cool 143 miles, or 233 kilometers, per second. That means by the time these slowpoke gravity waves trudge all the way to the Earth, the Sun would have moved straight up from the ecliptic about 110,000 miles. Jupiter wouldn't get the Sun's position for another 45 minutes, and the outer planets even longer. The further out you go, the longer it would take the same position of the Sun to be transferred to the planets. The planets are getting gravity information immediately. But how? Well, that's where the ether comes into play. First, though, let's talk about light. Now, Einstein's special theory of relativity came across a fatal case of dyspruvia with the Michelson-Morley experiment. I looked at this and imagined my surprise. Exactly the way experts pretend Houghton Arp didn't bust a lamp in the face of the directional redshift theory, these guys ignore rigorously tested and replicated experimental data, proving Einstein was wrong about the ether. After that, Dayton Miller drops a chandelier on what's left of the model by conducting far more vigorous repeats of this experiment to silence all the experts whining about the results. Miller and those that came before, by rotating a tabletop of mirrors and splitting a beam of light to bounce around and meet back at the start, were able to demonstrate that the ether had an effect on the speed of light, and that the predictions of relativity did not match the results of the experiment. Instead of meeting back at the same time as relativity predicted, they meet one after the other, as Miller predicts. Relativity busted. Now, naturally, the experts went back to the drawing board when faced with undeniable proof their model was mistaken. <laughs> just kidding. They just went straight back to pretending it didn't happen. Science! The cult had already been baptized into their loveless Big Bang gospel, and they were going to stick to it. After all, as long as your average Joe never heard of the experiment, well, it's like it never happened. Well, if you have no ethics and don't particularly care about being wrong and misleading the entire world, anyway. Honestly, I don't even know how these guys ever got away with pretending light doesn't require a medium to travel through. It seems so... yeah, that's not even wrong. I guess that's the extraordinary power of self-delusion. Only an intellectual would buy a notion like this because he saw some math on a board that said so. I guess maybe that's why they say intelligent people are better able to convince themselves of incorrect conclusions. Because for guys like me, it seems pretty common sense that a wave can't exist in nothing. Maxwell was right. Light is a transverse electromagnetic wave flowing through a medium, and that medium is the ether. What is the ether? Well, despite what big space feeds you, empty space is anything but empty. It's teeming with neutrinos, and every cubic centimeter is packed with them. Since neutrinos are resonant orbiting systems of charge, like all matter, they will respond to the electric force by distorting to form a weak dipole that aligns with the electric field. And that means the speed of light in a vacuum is just a measure of the response time of the neutrino to the electric force. Now, because neutrinos are all connected like a huge web, they have another interesting property that makes the EU model amazing. They daisy chain. Every square inch of space is saturated with them, and they are all interconnected resonant orbiting systems of charge. Therefore, if you pluck at a string, they all feel it. Allow me to demonstrate. If we are each holding the end of a jump rope and I give it a quick whip, a wave will travel along the length from me to you. That's light. Energy moving through a medium, the rope, over time. Now if I pull on that rope, you get that information instantaneously. That's the ether. 
a vast cosmic ocean of neutrinos that connect everything in the universe together. They're out there just waiting for some gamma radiation to flower into the stuff of matter. The electric model also explains the way starlight bends around the sun. It's important as it's a discovery that helped catapult Einstein to megastar status. But the residual found in the Michelson-Morley experiment shows that the Earth and all significant celestial bodies drag the ether along with them. The bending of starlight near the sun is just what you'd expect to see with the knowledge that there's an extensive neutrino atmosphere held to the sun by gravity. Light is slowed in the denser medium, causing normal refraction, or the bending of light. But what about time? Big space takes all kinds of liberties with the abstraction known as time. They act like you can travel in it, distort it, manipulate it. You can't. Time is an idea, just as the word forest is to a bunch of trees. It's the name we slap on the series of chronological events that occur in life. With all the bodies in the Milky Way galaxy communicating their positions effectively in real time through the electric force of gravity, it means there is a universal time, and relativity is describing fiction, not reality. And then comes my favorite, black holes. These things are a 100% mathematical fiction. A near-infinite, whatever that means, concentration of mass dreamed up by mathematicians to shoehorn in the needed sources of high energy seen at galactic centers. Without supercondensed matter, the entire thing falls apart, and as yet, we have no idea how to make it. We've never detected or directly observed it, and we don't actually know it exists. As of now, it remains one of those undiscoverable discoveries like dark matter that simply must be there because the idea that the model could be wrong, well, that's ridiculous. Never mind that the entire idea comes from dividing by zero. I mean, that's some high school level shenanigans. And what about the collimated jets of matter shooting out of galaxies? Why would a giant cosmic sinkhole for matter that's strong enough to keep light from escaping be expelling huge jets of matter? That literally makes no sense. Trouble is, the James Webb applied the five-point exploding heart technique to their Big Bang timeline, which means they don't know exactly where or when the magical fairy explosion occurred. And I guess that adds another layer of face palming to the so-called gravity waves the LIGO experts 100% totally discovered at their Laser Inferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory in 2015. And these are the people you have to take seriously if you want to publish anything or have any voice in mainstream science. The EU model does away with fantasy forces and properties, dealing only in what we can see, observe, and detect in the real physical world. We can show that where electrical energy is concentrated at the galactic center, gravity isn't necessary. And this is because at the center of a galaxy, there is no black hole. There's a plasmoid, a highly concentrated electrical phenomena that does everything gravity cannot. We know they're real. We don't need to add any magic to them. They just naturally do everything we actually observe. They explain the orbits, the strength, and the characteristics of galaxies, from their shape and structure down to their magnetic fields and collimated jets. All of these things can and have been shown exhaustively in laboratory experimentation. So for all things space, the EU model is an exceptional fit, but a theory of everything has to do more. It has to underpin every aspect of our universe, including us. And the implications for biological systems in this model are profound. A method of near-instantaneous signaling between resonant molecular structures within cells and on cell walls seems plausible and might provide us a way of looking at the mind-body connection and even extra-body communications. Hey, don't laugh. The CIA obviously thinks telepathy is real, and this model could provide a link between classical physics and the pioneering work of biologist Rupert Sheldrake, at least in the wheelhouse of biological morphogenesis and telepathy. Now, this electrical relationship between mass and matter allows us to understand how quasars can be newborn objects with low mass and brightness and high intrinsic redshifts. With time, their mass increases and their intrinsic redshift decreases in quantum jumps. Proof that quantum effects can happen at galactic scales, though only possible at the near-instantaneous speed of the electric force. Spooky action at a distance, anyone? So if we're right, that means the currently accepted story for the life cycle of stars is nonsense. They don't self-immolate, and they aren't internally powered hydrogen bombs contained by gravity. 
They are externally powered arc mode plasma phenomena that draw their power from the cosmic power lines of space, Birkeland currents. Now we have no idea where these things come from, but we can see them stretching all across the solar system and ranging all the way up to the monsters we see crossing from supercluster to supercluster. These are what give shape to our universe. So when you hear experts talking about super thin filaments that stretch a gazillion light years between galaxies, well, chances are those are Birkeland currents. Now, these Birkeland currents, in combination with the groundbreaking work of Houghton Arp, hammer the nail into the coffin of the Big Bang myth. And the James Webb is the one swinging the hammer. Space isn't expanding. There was no Big Bang. We see these currents flowing everywhere we look in stunning clarity, even if the experts at Big Space are still pretending not to. But that's where we come to the questions we can't answer. The age and extent of the universe is unknown. We can't even really guess, and we wouldn't pretend to. That would be misleading. This series may seem like the basis of a theory of everything, but until we have answers to the most fundamental mysteries of our origins and where all this energy comes from, well, we're just guessing in the dark. The EU model of cosmology doesn't offer any guesses about where all this comes from. We don't have an origin myth about the birth or the end of everything, and that makes stamping a date on things just about impossible. A shocking amount of what we're handed comes down to miseducated guesses made off of an incorrect major premise. Karl Popper, one of the 20th century's leading scientific philosophers, as well as the guy who came up with the theory of falsification, something the brains of big space should probably reread, quote, Insofar as a scientific statement speaks about reality, it must be falsifiable. And insofar as it is not falsifiable, it does not speak about reality. End quote. From the logic of scientific discovery in 1934. He had the idea that the pursuit of learning never ends, and there should never be a concept considered settled. No model that can't be challenged, because you just don't know what you don't know. But the good news for us here on this tiny blue planet, at least according to Wall Thornhill, is that we aren't isolated by time and space in a dark, dreary universe destined for a hopeless and tropic demise. What a depressing story. Quite the opposite, ladies and gentlemen. We are players interacting with and living in a vibrant and interconnected electric universe, where every action is carried across an ether of neutrinos by the electric force. The fact is, the greatest unknowns are still out there, and we can't talk sensibly about a beginning of the universe since we don't know the origin of electric charge, and the nature of the electric force remains a mystery. Mm -hmm.